Genesis 35. This chapter is Jacob returning back to Bethel, about 15 miles south of Shechem, a chapter filled with action. At least three people die in this chapter. Um, Reuben <clears throat> relinquishes his birthright in this chapter from his atrocious sin. Um, <clears throat> and this joy and sorrow, you know, there's, there's the 12th son is born, which makes the 12 tribes of Israel. All the other sons was born in Patan Aram. He's born here in the, 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 the promised land, you know, Benjamin. And so now we have this chapter where God is telling Jacob, go up to Bethel. And you're here tonight, where is God telling you to go up to? He tells him to go up to Bethel, go up there. And he says in verse 1, then God said to Jacob, arise, go up to Bethel, and dwell there and make an altar there to God. Because he made an altar earlier. Remember in Genesis 33 verse 20, he made an altar. But it wasn't prescribed by God for him to make an altar. But he made an altar. <clears throat> God wanted him to make an altar in Bethel. It says, make an altar there to God. This is some 30 years later. Who appeared to you when you fled from the face of Esau, your brother. And Jacob said to his household and to all who was with them, put away the foreign gods that are among you. <clears throat> Look, all of us should be saying that if you're a father here, you're the head of your household, you're a single mom, you should say, put away the foreign gods. Put away the foreign gods. Put them all away. All the things in your house that is foreign gods, you want them to be put away. He said, well, what's foreign gods in my house? I don't have the, you know, they had little, yeah. well, the foreign gods in the house sometimes can be the how to get away with murder TV show or, or, <clears throat> or some nasty show on TV. The psalmist says, Lord, you know, turn my eyes away from every worthless thing. You say, well, how can I determine whether something is good in my household or not? The simple answer to that is, does it bring glory to the Lord? That's it. Does it bring glory to the Lord? Whatever I do, does it bring glory to the Lord? Whatever TV show I look at, does it bring glory to the Lord? Whatever music I listen to, does it bring glory to the Lord? Whatever stuff I look at on my iPhone, does it bring glory to the Lord? If it don't, it's probably a foreign God that needs to be disposed of. And he says, look, put away the foreign gods that are <clears throat> among you. Apparently, they was almost living in a polytheistic house where they worship a number of gods. Purify yourselves. That can only happen when you remove those false gods. Purify yourself and change your garments. Remember when Joshua the high priest was standing before the Lord and Satan come along and tried to accuse him and says, the Lord rebuke you. And, and the Lord says, remove his filthy garments. Remove his filthy garments. Isaiah wrote in Isaiah 61 verse 10 I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. Clothed in righteousness. You know, put away those foreign gods. What gods do you have in your house that are foreign? Yet if Jesus came over, he said, oh, no, that can't be here in my presence. Think about the gods you may have at home.
Because you can't go forward without get, putting away these gods. You can't go forward without putting away the false gods in our lives. The things that nobody might not even see these things, but God sees them. God knows when you look at porn. He knows it. You say, how do you know that? Because he sees everything and he knows everything. And it's not just men that struggle with porn. Women, too. He knows what you look at. The eye gate affects the heart gate. The heart of the matter is the matter of the heart. And he says, let us arise and go up to Bethel, and I will make an altar there to God, who answered me in the day of my distress, and has been with me in the way which I have gone. So they gave, notice there's all their foreign gods, their earrings, it would have been. <clears throat> so they gave Jacob all the foreign gods which were in their hands. You know you got the wrong God if you can put them in your hand. You know you got the wrong God if he could fit in your hand or if you can, you know, smoke it or snort it, you know that's the wrong God. Or drink it. They had all kinds of gods in the Bible. They had, you know, the, the, the God of Mammon. They had Molech. They had Chemosh. They had, you know, in the Old Testament, Ashereth. Um, they had Dagon, the, you know, the, the Philistines. The Babylonians had Murdoch, the fertility God. You know, in the New Testament, they had, you know, Bacchus, the Romans, that, that's the God of wine. They had a God for wine. They had Aphrodite, the, the goddess of love and beauty and pleasure, you know, love, beauty, and pleasure, and, and sex, you know, temple prostitutes and so forth. Diana or, or Artemis, all kinds of gods in the Bible. But there's only one true God. Jesus says that in John 17, Three. There's one true God. And if you got a God in your hand, you got the wrong God. If you can drop him, you got the wrong God. If you can trip over him, you got the wrong God. If he can leave you, you made that man a God and he left you, you got the wrong God. Because our God says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. So you know you can't have the right God if he leave you. You're trying to run outside like baby kids. Remember, they say, he's trying to leave us. Remember? So you know you have the wrong God if this God can leave you or you can hold him in your hand. It says, and so they gave Jacob all the foreign gods which were in their hands and the earrings which were in their ears and Jacob hid them under the terebeth tree which was in Sh by Shechem and they journeyed and the terror of God was upon the cities that, they, that were all around them and they did not pursue the sons of Jacob. Interesting that when we obey God, it says, look, when a man way pleases the Lord, even his enemies are at peace with him. Even his enemies are at peace with him. The Bible says. So Jacob came to Luz, that is Bethel, which is in the land of Canaan. He's in the land of Canaan where God wanted him to be. He and all the people who were with him. And he built an altar there and called the place El Bethel, which means God, the house of God. Because there God appeared to him when he had fled from the face of his brother. Look, you can't, you can't come to the God of the house without knowing the God of the house. So if you come to the house of God, you should already know the God of the house. So many people come to the house of God, but they don't know the God of the house. Or at one point, they did know the God of the house. Circumstance happened. They left. 
Or some of them say, I got church hurt, or whatever that means. Or you backslid. But the God of the house, he wants us to know us when we come into the house of God. El Bethel, you know, El is always God. Bethel, house of God. The God of the house wants us to come to the house of the God, the house of God, because we know the God of the house. Not just come to the house of God and don't know the God of the house. That makes no sense. Who would go to somebody's house and don't know him? Only somebody crazy like me. I remember one time I was so drunk and I ran in this people's house in the projects. And I laid on a sofa and I just stayed there. And they said, something is wrong with him. And uh, when I looked up, it was just a bunch of blue suits all around me. And they was putting me in handcuffs. Taking me down 17th and Montgomery. I don't know how I got over their house. I just knocked on their door. When a girl opened the door, I just ran and bowed in and laid on a sofa. I was crazy. Who does that? Who comes to somebody's house and they don't know them? That's what happens when people come to the house of God that don't know God. That's what happens. They just in a house and they don't feel like they belong there. They get antsy. You ever brought an unbeliever to church? They get a little antsy. They don't want to be there. Because they don't know the God of the house, but they came to the house of God. And they don't belong there unless they give their life to Christ. And then they don't know why they should be in a relationship with the God of the house. Because when they come in the house, then they say, praise the Lord. I know the God of the house. It says, now Deborah, verse 8. She's a woman that came with Rachel. When, I mean, not Rachel, Rebecca, rather. When Eleazar was sent to get Isaac a wife, it says, and his nurse was with him. So her name was Deborah. She's the first Deborah in the Bible. It's not the Deborah in Judges 4.4 4, who was the judge. This is the first Deborah in the Bible. <coughs> a remarkable woman. Now Deborah, Rebecca's nurse, died, and she was buried below Bethel under the terebinth tree, so the name of it was called Alan Bakuth, which means oak of weeping. An oak of weeping. Then God appeared to Jacob again when he came to Paddan Aram and blessed him. And God said to him, your name is Jacob. Your name should not be called Jacob anymore, but Israel shall be your name. So he called his name Israel. This is going to be the name of the nation. The nation Israel gets his name from God, changing Jacob's name. He wrestled with Jacob. He says, no longer your name shall be Jacob, but Israel. Also God said to him, I am God, notice, Almighty El Shaddai, God Almighty, be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall proceed from your body, and kings shall come from your body. The land which I gave Abraham and Isaac, <clears throat> I give to you and to your descendants. After you, I give this land. This is God reaffirming the promise that he made with Jacob back in chapter 28, verses 13 and 14. One of the things to take note of, though, in verse um, 11 is that he said that kings shall come from your body. Kings. And they had kings. They had the kings of Israel, the northern kingdom, the 19 kings of Judah, the southern kingdom. That in the, you know, the northern kingdom, they didn't have, all those kings at the same testimony did evil in the sight of the Lord. The southern kingdom had some good kings. You had Asa, Jehoshaphat, um, Jothan, Uzziah, Hezekiah, jo you know, Josiah, and so forth. <clears throat> they had some good kings. 
But the northern kingdom didn't have any good kings. In fact, God never intended for them to have a king. Remember in 1 Samuel chapter 8? They said, we want a king like the other nations. And God said, no, you guys should be a theocracy, not a monarch. You know, a theocracy. I'll be your God. I'll be your king. It's funny how we want something else to be our king other than the Lord. We want something tangible that we can see to be our king. When we have the king of kings and lord of lords reigning over our lives and he wants to be in our life and he wants to be involved in everything that we do and we say, no, no, give me an earthly king. Some trust in chariots and some trust in horses, but we'll trust in the name of our Lord. Don't you trust in no president or no kings? Trust in the Lord with all thy heart. Lean not towards thy own understanding. In all thy ways, acknowledge him. He'll direct your paths. Plural, paths. They had kings that came from their tribes. And priests, the Levites. Then God went up from him in the place where he talked with him. So Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he talked with him, <coughs> a stone pillar, and he poured a drink offering on it. This is the first time that drink offering is mentioned in the Bible, the only time that it's mentioned in Genesis, the only place, a drink offering. <coughs> and <coughs> this is where, you know, where he would take this drink offering and they would actually essentially Pour the whole thing out. We need to pour the whole thing out. So it says, so Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he talked of him, and a pillar of stone, and he poured out a drink offering on it, and he poured oil on it. <clears throat> you remember Paul, the apostle Paul in 2 Timothy when he's ready to get his head cut off? Paul wrote Timothy the last words of Paul. 2 Timothy should be called the last words of Paul. And he says, for I am already, I've already been, this is emphatic, you know, already at, at the present moment being, he's saying, poured out as a drink offering, the, the, the libation. The drink offering poured out at the altar. Paul's life was poured out on the ground as he saw it. Life, his life was already in the hands of God. You know, I wonder, do people see their lives in the hand of God? I wonder. I wonder, do they see their, you know, do they see their Christians? Do they see their lives in the hand of God? Do you see your life in the hands of God? Because if you don't, you will take the steering wheel of life and figure it out. You'll take the steering wheel of life and figure it out yourself. How many of y'all had the steering wheel of your life before and you're glad God came and took it over? It's almost like teaching your child how to drive and you're on the other side, you know? How you want to grab that steering wheel back so bad from that kid. I remember one night coming from church and my son said, Dad, let me ride the rest of the way. I'm like, I don't know. He said, no, let me ride the rest of the way. I said, I don't know. He said, he said, come on, Dad. I said, all right. Man, I was putting on brakes and everything on the other side, you know. Ah, you know. <laughs> it's amazing. Our lives could be like a um, drink offering. Pour it out before the Lord. Paul knew that he was going to get his head cut off. If you knew you was Gary to get your head cut off, how would you live? What would your next five days be like? What would your next day five? Which, what would your next five days be like? Somebody told you, hey, you know, you got five more days left. And you do anything you want to do in those five days, what would you do? 
I know what I would do, but it's not fair to answer it, you know. I would try to come up with a plan so I wouldn't get my head cut off, you know. And here he says that he, he poured out a, a, a drink offering. Jacob is doing this. The, the Jacob who just knew about God, now he knows God. Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he talked with him, a pillar of stone, and poured a drink offering on it and oil. And Jacob came, and Jacob rather called the name of the place where God spoke with him Bethel, which means house of God. House of God. Do you know God? The world says, oh, yeah, I know God. What God? Is it the God of the Bible or is it the God of your own understanding? What God do you know? I know God. Do you really know God? Do you really know God tonight? So many people say, oh, I know God. You gotta always ask them, well, what God? Is it the Bible? The biblical God? Or the one from some other book? It says, then they journeyed from Bethel. And when there was a bit, and when there was but a little distance to go to Aphrathah, Af Aphrathah, same place, Rachel labored in childbirth, and she had hard labor. This is Rachel. <coughs> Rachel's pregnant with another child. She has one son named Joseph. So if you look at that chart up there to give you some insight about all these children. Now it came to pass when she had hard labor that the midwife said to her, do not fear, you will have this son also. And so it was, now one now did they know it was a son before he came. <laughs> that's, it. that's always interesting to me. And so it was as her soul was departing, for she died, she died, that she called his name Ben-One, which means son of sorrow. These are the last words of Rachel. Son of sorrow. These are the last words of Rachel. You know what's amazing? Now, I'm actually going to do this. I don't usually tell you all to do this, but I'm actually going to do this. Turn to Genesis chapter 30, verse 1. Turn there real fast. Hold your place where you are, but turn there real fast. Genesis 30, verse 1. And look, and look what it says. Now when Rachel saw that she bore Jacob no children, Rachel envied her sister and said to Jacob, give me children or else I die. And Jacob's anger was aroused against Rachel and said, Am I in the place of God who has withheld from you the fruit of the womb? Those are the first words from Rachel in Genesis 30, verse 1. Give me children, or else I die. Not knowing that when she had a second child, she would die. Not knowing that. The words were sort of prophetic. Not knowing this. Give me children or die. Well, she wanted another child and she would die. So verse 18 is an interesting verse. It says in chapter 35, and so it was as her soul was departed for she died that she called his name Ben-One but his father, meaning Israel or Jacob 
called him Benjamin. She called him son of sorrow. Jacob calls him son of my right hand. Benjamin means son of my right hand. That's what Benjamin means. <clears throat> He's the only son born in the land of Canaan. All the other ones was born in Patna Aram. Only son. It's interesting to me. This completes the 12 tribes of Israel. Knowing that Jacob would be removed out in a sense. <clears throat> and his two sons would be replaced and Levi would be moved out. Because <coughs> they wouldn't get any land. But these are the 12 tribes of Israel. 12 tribes of Israel. So Rachel died and was buried on the way of Aphrath, that is Bethlehem. She didn't get buried with Sarah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, even with Leah. Leah would get buried in the cave of Machpelah. She wouldn't get buried there. She gets buried somewhere else in Bethlehem. And Jacob set a pillar in her grave, which is the pillar of Rachel's grave to this day, then Israel, speaking of Jacob, journeyed, notice, and pitched his tent beyond the Tower of Eder. Eder means flock. Some scholars believe that it's a town, you know, in the area between Bethel and Hebron. This is, and it happened, notice this, when Israel dwelt in that land, that Reuben, this is his oldest son, went and laid with Bilhah, his father's concubine, and Israel heard about it. Reuben, the oldest son, <coughs> maybe prematurely he was thinking he could take over because Jacob's ready to die. He sleeps with his stepmother. To make it worse, he sleeps with his brother's mother. His brother's Bilhah had two of the sons. She had Dan and Nephtali. And he would lose his birthright in a sense. His inheritance in Genesis chapter 49, verses 3 and 4, and in 2 Chronicles 5.1, you go home and read it, 5.1 and 2, he's going to lose something. He lose First Chronicles five. Rather, he loses something. Look how messed up these families are. If you think your family is messed up, read the Bible. So I came from a dysfunctional family. Read the Bible. All of them was dysfunctional. I don't know any functional family in the Bible. Just dysfunctional. And it says in verse 23, Now the sons of Jacob were twelve. The sons of Leah were Reuben, Jacob's firstborn, who just slept with his stepmom, and Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun. The sons of Rachel were Joseph and Benjamin, the sons of Bilhah, Rachel's man, a maidservant, rather, was Dan and Nephtali. The sons of Zilpah, <coughs> Leah's maidservant, were Gad and Asher. These were the sons of Jacob, who were born to him in Patan Aram. Then Jacob came to his father Isaac in Mamre, Kirjath Arbor, that's Hebron, <coughs> where Abraham and Isaac dwelt, had dwelt. Now the days of Isaac, and you remember this, <coughs> were 180 years. Imagine living 180 years. He lived longer than all the other patriarchs. All of them. Abraham lived to be 175. We know that because of Genesis 25, verse 7. Um, Jacob will live 
I think it's Genesis 47, 28. But Jacob will live to be 147 years old. Isaac lives 180 years. He's the only one that was monogamous, too. He had one wife, Rebecca. She was a tricky woman, too. But he had one wife. One wife. It says, so Isaac breathed his last and died. Do you know you'll breathe your last one day and die? It's like this. <sighs> beep, beep. The machines go off, you know. They saw he's dead. Absent from the body. Present with the Lord. Dead to this world. A love in Christ. Amen? Oh, death, where's your sting, we should say. Says he breathed his last and died and was gathered to his people, being old and full of days. And his sons Esau and Jacob buried him. <laughs> I want to die like that, old and full of days. You know, the last chapter in the book of Job, it says, Job 42, 17, so Job died old and full of days. That's how I want to die, full of days. I don't want to be on a walker. I don't want nobody taking care of me, changing no diaper, none of that. Full of days. And most of them died like that. Jacob gets up on his... Staff says what he has to say. Went to bed and in heaven. Gone. Isn't that something? Breathe your last. Full life. Full life. Full of days. Every day was good. You woke up every day. This is the day that the Lord has made. I'll rejoice and be glad in it. You wake up like that in the morning. Most of us don't. We wake up, here's another day. I don't know why I'm going to make it. No, we shouldn't wake up like that. The Bible says he loads us daily with benefits. Great is your faithfulness, your mercies. I knew every morning. Wake up like that. This is the day that the Lord has made. Amen? Can we say that? This is the day that the Lord has made. Say it louder. This is the day that the Lord has made. Tis so sweet.